Hey everyone, this is Leanne, aka Lemon Gacha again. Today we are discussing how being perceived online changes our identities while I finish some sketchbook spreads. Quick disclaimer, this is simply commentary, a sprinkling of personal experiences, and observations on trends. I am not establishing a stance on any topic, nor vilifying any party involved. Also, not sure if this is like a video essay or a think piece or whatever, those both sound very pretentious, but regardless, please enjoy the video. Today, we will be tackling the various facets of perception online. To begin, I've been thinking of this concept with two sides. There is the observer, the one who is perceiving, and the subject, the one who is being perceived. Often, as participants in internet culture, we span both these roles and numerous others. The internet has progressed enough now that it's a core tenant of our world. It's a workplace, a school, a home, and the Colosseum all in one. It embodies a plethora of roles as well, while housing all of us as spectators in its walls. Social media culture in particular is big on the you had to be there mindset with its fast moving trends, unique language, content niches, and drama. And the tea is that it's all curated. We cherry pick our photos for Instagram, something between casual and put together. We don't want to look like we're trying too hard, caring too much, or taking things too seriously. All this has made me feel like I'm constantly performing for a spectator some kind of hidden camera that follows me around. But more on this another time. Thus, our perceptions of ourselves are warped because we're switching out the lenses in which we view ourselves through. We share and we share, exchanging bits of our lives for a bit of a chance to be seen, maybe praised, maybe understood, maybe just for fun. This is just the way things are. We long to be perceived, but doesn't it all feel like we're doing it for someone else? Who can say? One, in George Sontag's book, he states that celebrities exist in such a competitive environment that they must therefore remain present on all the accessible media channels in order to capture the audience's attention. However, with the wide range of social media personas, people very similar to you and me, who encompass a wide range of niches, there is, in essence, someone for everyone online. In the age of social media, the constant watchful eye of the internet, there is a massive increase in the prevalence of parasocial relationships. Parasocial relationships refer to the kind of one-sided relationship that occurs when one party is emotionally attached and places their interest on a persona. Think celebrities. This person is completely unaware of the other's existence. Historically, this relationship is defined as something that audiences of television or mass media experience with the figures on screen. Because of the internet, the introduction of the interactive element, messaging, commenting, general accessibility, and faux feeling of connection to the persona, makes for a deeper connection, or is it delusion, in the audience. And all of us have taken a seat in the audience at least a few times. You're even here right now. According to findapsychologist.org, this is somehow such a funny website URL. Like, yes, thank you, I will find one, actually. These parasocial relationships have transformed into more interactive environments, allowing individuals to communicate with their media personas and increasing the intimacy and strength of the parasocial relationship. Anyone who shares their experiences online are susceptible to being the object of affection. However, this type of relationship doesn't even have to be romantic. There are comfort content creators. We rewatch their videos to laugh, to feel like there's a friend hanging out with us. We have favorite YouTubers, favorite TikTokers, people who are uniquely themselves who receive comments saying, I wish I was your friend in real life. But that's just the problem, isn't it? This isn't real life. Not really. 
Let's do an imagined scenario with a personal experience of mine. Imagine a not so stranger who is around your age has a parasocial crush on you. The first time you meet, they already know everything there is to know about you because of what you shared online music tastes, current struggles. Imagine they even quote specific lines from your videos. You're 10% flattered and 90% uncomfortable. But it's not really hurting anyone, right? The way they continue to interact with you is commodifying and not a little dehumanizing, which you're able to brush off until you tell your friends and they freak out. Tell an adult to make sure nothing will happen to you and share your location with a friend. This person, they also try to tell you what to do and how to act. They impose their likes and dislikes on you and expect compliance. I become a paper doll. I'm flattened for consumption. Who will listen to a paper doll when she says she's uncomfortable? This person has willfully ignored the parts of your identity that don't fit their narrative. The handpicked parts of my identity from the image I post online are grasped tightly in their hands. Did I actually share that much? In conversations with this person, I start referring to myself in the third person. Because who is this Leanne but a sourdough starter of an idea that's grown into a loaf of bread that's unrecognizable to me? Perhaps I've used six too many metaphors here, but you get it, right? This tiny thing that's a comparative water drop in the bucket of my life experiences causes a tornado of cognitive dissonance. And I think, are these the inevitable consequences you reap from existing on the internet? So the sense of self is shattered due to its already fragile and nebulous nature, not because of the obsessive possessive behavior, but because it makes me wonder if everyone is perceiving me in this 100% incorrect way. I think, is this how everyone sees me? And it scares me shitless because to be seen wrongly hurts a lot more than not being seen at all. Because here are parts of yourself in this idea that someone has of you, but it's warped and convoluted to fit them. Like when your cute silicone dashboard companion melts in the sun, it's still the same plastic, the same stuff, but where is identity if not the shape? The moral of the story is, don't place an idealized made up version of me on a pedestal and then get mad when the real me shows up. Two. You can tell I heard the words cognitive dissonance in my AP psych class at the ripe young age of 17 and ran with it for years to come, because now we're talking about the disconnect between the self and the online self. There will always be a gap between who we are and who we present ourselves to be. In life and online, wherever you exist to any capacity, we hold our true selves within us away from prying eyes. With the rise of lifestyle and vlog culture, along with the growing implication that oversharing is the cool new thing, there is an expectation that we should always be privy to the lives of others and vice versa, especially if they place vulnerable pieces of themselves out for us to see. The sense of entitlement fans feel, it's been touched on quite a bit, so I'll keep this brief. Any public figure, I'm using the term public figure very loosely here, is showing their lives, how they act, and what they do to people, people that they don't know. But we feel as if we know them, and we don't. That, in and of itself, can be jarring. You know, hit us with that sweet, sweet cognitive dissonance. But this is a two-way street, and we identify with these people. They shape our identities. We filch their mannerisms and jokes. We follow them and come to know their usernames by heart. We buy the products from the companies they're sponsored by, and we trust their opinion. We're more influenced by influencers than we'd like to think. So when they act in a way that's out of the ordinary, that disconnect we mentioned earlier comes into play, things can get ugly, such as the cycle of stan culture. For me anyway, when the gap gets too large between the self and the online self, it causes the mental discomfort that results from holding two conflicting beliefs, values, or attitudes. This is the dictionary definition of 
Say it with me, kids. Cognitive dissonance. Oftentimes, I can't really grapple with the fact that I'm living, in essence, two lives, one existing online and one in real life. If people mention my social media presence at school, I cringe. It's a knee-jerk reaction. I feel as if there is a Venn diagram and the tiny slice in the middle where my lives overlap is a dangerous place to be and for others to know about. Three, on the Boy Genius EP, you'll find a song called Bite the Hand. Not only is this the song of the year, the line, here's the best part distilled for you, is somehow such a raw, poignant statement that describes our next topic with just a few words. So now what? We know we curate an experience for people, whether we have a following or not. Posts made specifically to garner attention are commonplace on the internet, like thirst traps. There are even smaller categories like Gatsby posting, where you share something that's specifically meant to be seen by one person, much in the way Gatsby hosted his extravagant parties to hopefully see one particular girl. A great deal of our experience online is committed to the act of wanting to be seen, but in a very specific way by a very specific set of eyes. This one is for my artists out there. After all, we are an art channel. If you're on the internet as an artist, you start attaching value to your following. Often art and the self are inseparable, and when you post, it's essentially offering a chunk of yourself out for the people to partake in. If they compliment you, great, you're chained to the feeling. And if they misinterpret you, don't take something seriously, or generally don't give the reaction you wanted to have when posting. But what can we do? Once we hit post, we release partial ownership to the internet. She has custody of our child. Plus, once someone has perceived you, made their assumptions, established their version of you in their mind, it's not something you can change without a tussle. So, is this something we should worry about at all? Art is meant to be perceived, but it's also an extension of ourselves. Creation is a liability. And who do we really do it for? If we simply say ourselves, we may be lying. More likely, everything we do is a mix of motivations, in which an online audience takes no small part. My sketchbooks weren't really meant to see the light of day, minus a few close friends. It was originally supposed to be a little slice of my heart that I kept in a book form for myself, like a well-worn childhood novel meant for revisiting. Now there's a sketchbook tour video with 100,000 views. Seeing this, my brain, desperate for more validation, decided to post more sketchbook content on my Instagram, and it came as no surprise that these posts did particularly well, further reinforcing my monkey brain. The students in my department at school have definitely flipped through the pages of my mind as well, and the teachers too. I'm not regretful of any of this. All of it was a conscious choice, right? I'm actually grateful that my sketchbook has opened doors for connecting with others, but in the beginning, I was sketching simply for the sake of it. Now, when I open the pages, I subconsciously think if it's going to be appropriate for my professor to show whatever I'm about to draw in the classroom, or if the aspect ratio will look good on Instagram? And will it be part of a YouTube video later? How should I caption my post? And which hashtags will show my work to the people who matter? The motivations are polluted by the thoughts of post drawing for when the images are released to the World Wide Web. It's become a product, really, and that's kind of how commodification happens to creators. It seems that the work, the creator, and the platform cannot exist separately, which leads us right into Mitski's tweet. 
Mitski is a Japanese American singer songwriter who is known for writing heart wrenching lyrics to the beat of indie rock. She is very candid about her experiences through her work, and her emotions are on full display within her music. Mitski is currently not active on social media, all her accounts are run by her management. On Thursday, February 24th of this year, a tweet surfaced on Mitski's account describing that when people spend an entire concert recording the show, it makes her feel like she's just a commodity. A few significant excerpts from the tweet are as follows Quote, I wanted to speak with you about phones at shows. They're a part of our reality. I'm not against taking photos at shows, but sometimes when I see people filming entire songs or whole sets, it makes me feel as though we are not here together. I love shows for the feeling of connection, of sharing a dream, and remembering that we have a brief miraculous moment of being alive at the same time before we part ways. When I'm on stage and look to you, but you are gazing into a screen, it makes me feel as though those of us on stage are being taken from and consumed as content. Instead of getting to share a moment with you, ultimately, it's your night and I want you to enjoy it as you like. I don't want to be greedy, I'm fortunate to get to play. Just putting out there that sometimes, if we're lucky, we can experience magic at a show, but only if we're there to catch it. End quote. We truly cannot know anything about Mitski's true self. We know she uses her music as a creative outlet, as many artists do. It's clearly something very personal to her. Unfortunately, many fans were unhappy about her tweet, citing personal issues that made it necessary to film the show. There was so much backlash that the tweet was eventually deleted. However, this whole debacle started as a polite request, and the reaction indicates something serious. Artists are just another piece of entertainment for consumption now. Mitski is just another TikTok soundbite that's been slowed with added reverb for aesthetics. Rather than perceive for the human being she is. Rather, even her expressions of raw human emotion have been warped into another selling point of her character, when in actuality, is a vital part of her identity. Commodification, it'll get ya. Five. Maybe the truth is that we're all just the mice in testing boxes who receive the funky little treat when we hit the right button, so we keep doing it. But it's never satiating, and truly being seen never shows up in the treat bag. I wonder if that's one of the reasons we keep existing on the internet. We hope to be understood one day. Or maybe it's just the funny videos live here. I'm putting my money on the funny videos, frankly. Anyway, let's wrap this baby up. I personally feel that social media being just a skosh adjacent to real life is what's creating such a hold on us. These are real people with real lives. And if we try a little harder, that could be us. But there's a disconnect, right? We're all actors on a stage or in the audience, and some of us have balcony seats, so it's even harder to see what's really going on down there. So we carry on. Crafting our lives, our work to show online, building up this alter ego, almost playing God, in which we are the creators of our own personas. But then we begin to wonder where the real me ends and where the other begins.